you will, go ahead and take your Bibles and join me. Matthew chapter 15. And hold your place there. That will be one of the passages we're looking at tonight. Matthew 15, 21. And then Mark 7, 24. Both of the gospel writers recording the same event here. A little bit different perspective from each. I'm going to read Matthew's account for you, but if you want to keep your thumb there, Mark will be going back and forth between the two. Let's have a word of prayer before we read. Our gracious Father, we are coming now and we're approaching your word. Our desire is to study your word. Father, the intended, the expressed um, intent of our study is to learn about the life of Christ, to learn about Jesus Christ, to know Him a little better. And Father, that is our desire. Much as a spouse, uh, how we desire to know them better so that we can love them more, our desire is to study about Christ and learn about Him so that we can love Him better, so that we can serve Him better. And so, Father, we can understand Him better, and so we can have the mind of Christ. We can think like Christ did. And so we ask tonight as we study through this passage, as we look at these two recorded events, of this moment in the life of Christ, we pray that the Holy Spirit would give us some understanding, uh, give us some insight, and, Father God, mold our lives so that we're more like Him tonight. We ask that in the wonderful name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, in Matthew's account, I'm going to begin reading in verse 21 and read through 28. And I'm going to ask you, we normally don't do this on Sunday night, but we're going to read this passage. If you would, out of reverence and respect to the reading of God's Word, stand with me as we read this. Matthew 15, 21 says, Jesus went away from there and withdrew into the district of Tyre and Sidon. And a Canaanite woman from that region came out and began to cry out, saying, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is cruelly demon-possessed. But he did not answer her a word. And his disciples came and implored him, saying, Send her away, because she keeps shouting at us. But he answered and said, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and began to bow down before him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered and said, It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she said, Yes, Lord. But even the dogs feed on the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus said to her, O oh woman, your faith is great. It shall be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed at once. You may go, go ahead and be seated. We're transitioning into a point in time in, in the life of Christ when his date on the cross is getting very close, he is about a year away from death. His time is getting close. The hour that he has said several times is not yet come it is creeping ever closer. As he looks back, as we look back at his ministry, he has made several trips back and forth to Jerusalem, but the majority of his time has been spent in Galilee. He's done some preaching tours, three preaching tours in Galilee, calling people to repentance and faith. He began his ministry, the early part of his ministry, he began in Judea. He then went into Galilee, uh, trips back and forth, but the majority of it has been spent in Galilee. He has been calling people to repentance and faith. Early in his ministry, he was rejected by the religious leaders in Jerusalem. But during the, 
his time of preaching in Galilee, specifically the second missionary journey, he was rejected by the people. They reject him as the Messiah. He does complete a third missionary tour where that rejection com becomes very complete. Um, they do not accept him as the Messiah, but they do accept him as this great miracle worker. They quit following him as Messiah, but he can still draw a crowd because of what he can do, because of the fact that he can feed multitudes, because of the fact that he can heal the sick. Well, his time is drawing close. He's getting ready to, to die on the cross, and shortly thereafterwards, he is getting ready to ascend to the Father, and when he does he is going to charge his 12 disciples, his 12 apostles, with the task of evangelizing the world. They're not ready. Not only is he going to charge them with that task, but there's something that he's got to teach them. They're not going to take that well, something he has not told them yet. And we're not going to see that tonight. I'll go ahead and tell you what it is, but he has not yet told them that he's going to die. That is going to be a shock to the system. And so he has got to, what his desire is, is to begin some intense training with these 12 men. One on 12, one on one, really instructing them, really teaching them, preparing them for the ministry that they are getting ready to take over. And he can't do that with crowds. When there's 4,000, 5,000 people around him, he can't do that. And so notice there in verse 21, Matthew says, but Jesus went away from there and withdrew. He's getting away from the people. His desire is to get away from the people. And notice he goes to the district of Tyre and Sidon. He is going to a place outside of Israel. He, he's, he's trying to get away from the Jewish people as much as possible. Now, he's, he's doing that for that purpose, but also another reason is the Jewish leaders, we, we've read several times, or you, if you've read through the Gospels, you know, in John chapter 5, verse 18, in John chapter 7, verse 1, um, the Jewish leaders, they were looking to kill him. It's not time yet. And so he's staying away from that as well, but he is drawing away. He wanted to get away where he could teach his disciples. He wanted to get along with them. So he goes to the region of Tyre and Sidon. It's way up in the northwestern part. Um, he's getting away from them. He goes into this region, the region of Tyre and Sidon. Mark just mentions Tyre. He, Mark 7:24 says, Jesus got up and went away from there to the region of Tyre. Again, into a pagan place. A, a place, it is modern day Lebanon, but it is a place that has a long history of conflict with Israel. Kind of safe to go if you're trying to get away from Jewish people. If there's a long history of conflict, they're not going to go, so you can get away from them. And so that's where he goes. Something else about the region of Tyre, that's where Jezebel is from, which tells you what kind of relationship, what, what kind of people are from there. Josephus writes in his, his writings that the inhabitants of Tyre were notoriously one of, the, one of Israel's bitterest and that's his word, not mine, bitterest enemies. Now, I want to draw your attention to something. Matthew points this out very clearly, that this is not an evangelistic trip. And in verse 24, he says, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. 
if this was an evangelistic trip, he would have been in Israel. That's who he said he was sent to, right? This is not an evangelistic trip. This is an opportunity. This is the, the, go, the goal of this is to get away so that he can teach his disciples. If you've got your hand there in verse 24 of Mark, chapter 7, listen to what this says. Jesus got up and went away from there to the region of Tyre. He went and entered the house. He wanted no one to know of it. Again, he, he's trying his best to get away. Even in Tyre, where it's full of pagan people, he doesn't want to draw attention to himself. He didn't want anyone to know, and yet it says, yet he could not escape notice. He could not escape notice. Mark chapter 3 verse 8 tells us, listen to this. Mark chapter 3 verse 8 starting in verse 7 says, Jesus withdrew to the sea with his disciples and a great multitude of Galilee followed him and also from Judea and from Jerusalem and from Edomia Beyond the Jordan and the vicinity of Tyre and Sidon, a great number of people heard of all that he was doing and were going to him. So in this region they had heard about him. You can imagine how quickly news travels, especially in small towns. News gets out real quick. I'm reading about this, uh, you know, he's... He's been to this, in a, in a region there, the people heard about him, now he's going to this region, and he doesn't want anybody to know about it. I keep thinking when I got to go to Brazil several years ago, um, being in Brazil and being the only person in town with blue eyes, I was like the calling card. And that's all I was used for is to draw a crowd. We would go into a house with two or three people and they don't have doors, so they just kind of clap, walk right on in. No one said, come in. They just clap, walk right on in the house, uh, walk into the kitchen. The ladies say, hey, we're here to, you, you see this white American with blue eyes? Oh, look at that. And all of a sudden, there'd be 10 people there, and then 20 people, and then 30 people. There'd be people peeking in the doors and the windows. They'd be sitting all over the living room, all through the house, because they'd never seen blue eyes before. Here Jesus is. And they've heard about him. They've heard about the miracles he can do. Can you imagine how quick word spread through Tyre? The miracle worker's here. The healer is here. He's here. But he doesn't want to know it. Yet he cannot escape notice. Both of them tell us Matthew says, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and began to cry. But Mark says, but after hearing of him, a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately came and fell at his feet. Let's look at this woman just a moment. Matthew says this about her. She was a Canaanite woman. And from her cry to Jesus, we know that her daughter is sick. Mark tells us that she was a woman with an unclean daughter. And then Mark says in verse 26, Mark 7, 26 says, Now the woman was a Gentile. Every, everything he tells us here tells us something about this woman. All right? She was a Gentile. She was not a Jew. She was not of the covenant people. Mark is being very specific by letting us know that. And Matthew did the same thing when he said she was a Canaanite. She's a Canaanite. She was not from Jerusalem, but she was of the people that would have been around that area before they came in. And then he says of the Syrophoenician race, um, there's a Phoenicia in, in near Egypt, a Phoenicia up here. They're the ones controlled by Assyria, not the ones controlled by Egypt. That's what he means by uh, the Syrophoenician race. But a word we've skipped over here, and they've used it a couple times, and it's really unnecessary when you're given the fact that she had a daughter. Do you notice that word woman? There, there's meaning behind that. Remember, in this society, those are second-class people. 
They were second class. So she was a woman. She was a Canaanite, and she was a Syrophoenician race. What they're trying, what they're, both of the writers are trying to get across is in the eyes of society, she's nobody. Meaningless. Nobody would give time to a woman, a Gentile. They're drawing that attention. They're, they're making sure we're aware of that going on here. But notice this woman comes. And in, back in Matthew, Matthew 15, 22, it says, A Canaanite woman from that region came out and began to cry out, saying, Have mercy on me. Stop there a second. There's a difference between this woman and the Jews that have been chasing Jesus around all over Galilee. They were like, you're the Messiah, do this for us. You are the Messiah, feed us. You're the Messiah, uh, give, us our, give us our breakfast, give us our lunch. You're the Messiah, heal. You're the Messiah, give life. You're ours, do what we say. I mean, the prophecy said you would come to us. You're ours. There, there was an arrogance about the Jewish people when they come to Christ. But notice here, she says, Lord, now, now that might be a, a term of, of divinity, and it might not. It might simply be, and there, there's nothing wrong with this, it might just simply be respect. But she says, have mercy on me. Now, there's a confession in that request. I don't deserve anything. I don't deserve anything from you. Have mercy on me. Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is cruelly demon-possessed. Don't, don't, uh, don't skip over that statement, son of David. Keep in mind everything we've been told by both Mark and Matthew. This is a Canaanite woman, a Gentile woman. No access to the covenants, no access to the Jewish scriptures, no access to the temple, no access to the worship of the one true God. And yet she comes and she says, Lord, have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. That's a messianic title. <laughs> this is a Canaanite woman. How'd she know that? Look, we, ha we have to assume here, if you go back to Mark, Mark says, but after hearing of him. All right, she's got a sick daughter, right? What do you imagine, what do you think she's done? Uh, she's got a daughter who's demon-possessed. What do you think she has done for her daughter? Uh, if you're a parent, you would probably answer that by saying anything she could, everything she could. She's probably been to doctors. She's probably been to, to everybody she could. And, and given the fact that she's a Canaanite woman, a Gentile woman of the Syrophoenician race, she has probably gone to the altars of her pagan gods. And now she's desperate. But she hears of one. You reckon maybe she's done a little research into this, this one? You're telling me he can heal. Who is this? We know she's done some kind of research because this Canaanite woman comes in and says, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David, the Messiah, the Jews' Messiah, not the Gentiles' Messiah, right? She says, Son of David, she, she knows who he is. She's done some research here. Son of David, my daughter is cruelly demon-possessed. So here we have this, this woman that is coming uh, in, in such a gentle, 
humble manner. And Mark tells us that she came in, said to her, un, she come in and said, he, it, <laughs> let me start over. Mark says in verse 25, after hearing of him, a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately came in and fell at his feet. So here she is in humility, knowing that he doesn't owe her anything, asking for mercy. And Matthew says, but he did not answer her a word. Well, wouldn't that have been a crushing blow? You've heard from your neighbors and all these people around you that this man has healed people before. So you go to him with your problem and you demonstrate all this humility. You demonstrate, um, you know, I know, I know who you are. You're showing this respect and you ask for help and it says he did not answer her a word. You know, that's only happened, happens one other time in Scripture. Only one other time is Jesus being confronted with an individual and he doesn't answer that person a word, and that's Herod. When, 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 they take, when Pilate sends him to Herod, and Herod is, oh, I want to see a miracle from you, and he's, he's asking him all these questions, and it says Jesus didn't answer him a word. The only the two people in all of Scripture that Jesus doesn't answer, and I mean, we can understand Herod, Herod had John the Baptist killed, but here this woman is, Lord, Messiah, have mercy on me. And he doesn't answer her a word. Three possible reasons, though. There are three possible reasons why he doesn't answer her. Number one, he didn't come to heal. He came to get away. Again, Matthew 15, 24, he was sent only to the house of Israel. This is not healing or evangelistic. He's not there to do that type of work. Maybe he didn't, wasn't going to because of that. Number two, healings always draw crowds. He doesn't want a crowd. He can, he's not, he's going to lose the opportunity to teach his disciples, and he doesn't have long if he draws a huge crowd. He's trying to get away from them, not draw them. Three, and most likely, this is a teaching moment for his disciples. They've seen the shallow faith from the Jews. They've seen the attitude of expectancy and demanding from their Messiah. They've seen people who believed until the teaching got tough, like John chapter 6. Remember John chapter 6, there was, he fed 5,000 people plus the women and children. So there's an all kind of crowd there. And the next day they even chased him to the other side of the lake. They were following him. They're ready to make him king. Remember, until the teaching got tough, and then they all left, didn't they? That's what the Jews, that's what his disciples have seen. People who are believing until the teaching gets tough. Boy, it started off tough immediately here, didn't it? Lord, have mercy on me. Nothing. Well, <laughs> She doesn't back off. She persists. He didn't answer her a word. Mark says, and she kept asking him to cast the demon out of her daughter. Means that she doesn't stop asking. Matthew, I love the way Matthew puts it. Matthew said, but he did not answer her a word. And his disciples came and implored him. They're begging him, get rid of this woman. She won't stop yelling at us. Get rid of this woman. Now, look, there could be two possibilities here. They could be saying, will you tell her to just get out of here? Well, if he does that, which is basically what he's done, what's she going to do? She's going to keep asking. Might they be saying, would you please just grant her what she's asking for so she'll leave? 
She is getting on our nerves. <laughs> Get rid of this woman. So here, maybe they're on her side, sort of, to get rid of her. They implore him, send her away. And then Matthew says, but he answered and said, who's he answering here? Not the woman. They're the ones that have asked. He is answering his disciples, but he's also answering his disciples where she can hear. And this is blow number two. Blow number one was not answering her. Now she's got <laughs> some kind of help at least to get rid of her. And, and it says, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. You could keep saying and saying where he said, and not Gentiles. I'm not here for her. Blow number two. Twice here she's been rejected. Twice here her really her only hope has either not answered her or instead of even directing her, instead of talking to her directly, indirectly telling others, I ain't even here for her. What would your response be at this time if you were that woman? How many people do you know that would say something like this? Oh, I've tried, Jesus. But I didn't get what I asked for. So I left. It didn't work out the way I wanted it to. I found the church cold. I found the church people rude. I found them arrogant. I found them closed off. I tried, Jesus, but I didn't find compassion. Has she found an ounce of compassion here? Nothing. Nothing but rejection twice now. So he says, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, Verse 25 of Matthew, but she came and began to bow down before him, saying, Lord, help me. So now he says, it's not good to take the children's bread to throw it to the dogs. Blow number three. <laughs> he's, he's hit her again. It's not good to take the children's bread and give it to the dogs. In the context here, based on what he's just said, I was sent to the house of Israel. Uh, Israel are the children. She's the dog. And what he is saying is true. You would not prepare a meal for your children and give it to your dog instead. It's prepared. And given the context, look, they don't have cupboards full of food like we do. They might have, might have enough for that meal. And if that's all you've got, the dog can do for itself, right? You're going to take care of the children. The children are the ones going to get fed, not the dog. The dog can go fend for itself. And that's what Jesus is saying. I have a meal prepared, but it's for the children, not the dogs. Well, now what are you going to do? Three times, three times here, rejection. Not saying a word, talking to someone else, and then when he finally does, what I've got's not for you. Verse 27, Matthew 15, 27. But she said, Yes, Lord. I love that. You know what she's saying? I am a dog. I don't deserve anything from you. I'm not part of the covenant. I know I'm not one of the children. Yes, Lord. But even the dogs 
feed on the crumbs. I don't want the meal. I'm not asking you for the meal. But even the dogs feed on the crumbs from the master. And what she's saying here, you're the master from the master's table. Listen to the humility. This is so much different than what he's run into from the Jews. Demanding being fed. Demanding the work of the Messiah. Demanding the works. And here this woman, this Gentile, (laughs) comes and says, but Lord, you're right. I am a dog. Even the dogs eat from the master's table. Verse 28. Then Jesus said to her, O woman, your faith is great. It shall be done for you as you wish. Look, we know that the whole time he was going to heal this child, don't we? This was a test for his disciples. This was probably a test for her faith. And she doesn't give up. She doesn't go walk away. She knows who this is. He may be the, gen, uh, the, the Messiah of the Jews, but he is there. She knows he is the son of David. She knows based on what she's heard before, he is a man of compassion. And she doesn't give up. She doesn't leave. How persistent are you? As you're praying for the salvation of a loved one, I've been praying for 10 years and nothing. Yeah, not a word to her either. I've been praying for 10 years and other people have been saved. Yeah, he talked to the disciples. He didn't talk to her. Persistence. Persistence. That's true faith. True faith is being persistent. It is the faith of the Jews who left that is not true faith. They walked away. This woman's not walking away. She is persistently pursuing him. And another thing about it, I've tried to draw this out She's persistently humble. God doesn't owe us a thing, does he? He doesn't owe us anything. And yet, (laughs) we are the children. We're not the dogs at the table. We are the children that it has been prepared for. Persistence. Jesus heals this daughter. Something else I want to point out to you before we close tonight. Mark says, Mark 7, 29, and he said to her, because of this answer, go. The demon has gone out of your daughter. What proof does she have? None, right? Is this an evil trick to just get rid of her so she'll leave and then he can go hide somewhere? How's she going to know unless she goes home? She can't pull out her texter machine and send a text and say, how you doing? She can't pull up the cameras at the house and see if the girl's gotten out of the bed. She's got to go home. And he didn't go anywhere. He didn't touch her. He didn't say hocus pocus. Poof. He didn't shake a little wand. He didn't have pixie dust coming out of the ceiling fans. He didn't blow on her. He just said, go. The demon is gone. And then Mark says, and going back to her home, she found the child lying on the bed. The demon had left. 
we know how he did this. We know it's because he's the sovereign God of the universe. He didn't have to be with that little girl. He didn't have to say any kind of spell. He healed from where he was. And then again, the woman demonstrates even more faith. He said, go, I'm going. He said, she's healed. I'm going home just like she's healed. What kind of trip do you think this was for that woman? Do you think she ran the whole way? Do you think she cried, laughed, prayed, celebrated, felt bad for having approached him? Probably a range of emotions going through, right? But his little, her little girl was healed. This is, a, this is a challenge to us. Jesus doesn't always answer the first time we ask. Sometimes years down the road, he's still not answering. The persistent faith stays with him even when he doesn't answer. Persistent faith trusts him even when he doesn't answer because we know he is able. And even when the answer is no, we know that he is able to carry us through that time. Let's close with a word of prayer together. Pray with me. Father, we thank you for this, this woman. What an example, what an encouraging, what a challenging example she is to us. Father, a woman of extraordinary faith, a woman of extraordinary persistence, love for her daughter, respect for the master, and just an unwavering faith. Lord, we thank you that we, we can look at this passage and we can look at our own life and know you love us. When the answer is no, you love us. When you are quiet, when you don't answer, it is still because of your love for us. Father, we pray that you would give us faith like this woman had, faith to be persistent in our pursuit of you, faith in our, uh, our, our devotion to you. And Father, we pray that you'd help us to be an encouragement to others who are in need of you. Use us now as we leave this place, as we uh, leave looking forward to next Sunday now. We pray, Father, that you'd use us through this week to witness, to encourage, uh, to in witness to a lost soul, to encourage a fellow believer. Father God, we look forward to being back to worship next week. In the wonderful name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.